Okay, it's going to be a review of ECW's Hardcore Heaven 1999. Uh, we're coming up on the 25th uh, anniversary of the show. Um, and, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to review it, you know, Rob Van Dam and Jerry Lynn is, you know, one of my favorite matches of all time. Um, you know, you could definitely argue that Living Dangerously match was actually better than this, but this is Hardcore Heaven. This is the rematch. For whatever the reason, this one was more accessible. I think when ECW got the television deal on TNN, I think Paul Heyman loved the match so much that he just he just played this match for the first show. And, um, you know, the first, I think, ECW DVD compilation, I think it was called Extreme Revolution. This was actually uh, the first match on that set. And, yeah, that was pretty accessible. Like, you could get it at the video stores. So this was really, like, my first experience, you know, with the old school ECW Away from the invasion, obviously. Uh, but yeah, man, I, I would still say RVD and Jerry Lynn. You know, it's probably been topped in terms of, you know, incorporating athleticism with hardcore spots. I think Kenny Omega and Osprey have probably topped this. But, you know, still RVD and Jerry Lynn, I always say that's one of my top 10, you know, favorite matches ever. And, you know, the, the two best, I would say, were Living Dangerously and hardcore heaven. They've had other good matches as well. The, you know, their their last ECW match, Guilty as Charged, two thousand one, you know, was was pretty awesome in the Hammerstein Ballroom. And uh, you know, they had matches in TNA. They the, the first uh, match was actually at the ECW Arena in nineteen ninety eight. So there's a lot to choose from with RVD and Jerry Lynn. But these two matches, you know, in early nineteen ninety nine, I would I would definitely say they still hold up as uh, you know their two best and you know some of the some of the best matches of all time. Uh, but we're gonna go back. To May 16th, uh, 1999. This is Extreme Championship Wrestling. Uh, this was a pay per view and it was in Poughkeepsie, New York. I don't even know where that is. I think it's a little bit, you know, north of the city. Uh, the arena is actually called the Mid Hudson Civic Center. They do an attendance of 2,800 and uh, commentary by jo Joey Styles and Cyrus the Virus. All right, Cyrus is actually not on this show. He he interferes in a couple of matches. I think he interferes in the Lance Storm match. So if you haven't seen Cyrus the Virus, it's actually Don Callis. And, um, you know, I mean, they, they look totally different now. This, this is when uh, Don Callis had uh, sunglasses and the hair. And, uh, you know, Paul Heyman created him as like a... Um, an evil guy from the network and it was it was pretty pretty cool i like to kind of revisit you know some of the uh early incarnations of uh of cyrus the virus uh the pay-per-view buy rate you know if you if you could interpret this number here i'd like to know the i couldn't find an exact number but you know this is the pay-per-view rating scale a 0 0.23 all right, so I'm looking up the buy rate here. It says that ECW pay-per-views generally did, pretty much all of them did between 70,000 and 75,000, which is pretty good. That's not bad. And you got to keep in mind, you know, ECW wasn't, you know, really on a great television deal. Um, well, I think they were about to get on TNN or at this time, I don't know if the the deal was officially there yet. You know, I th I think yeah, obviously that will be coming because they would they actually threw back the uh, RVD and Jerry Lynn match for the first television show. So it's pretty good, you know, that they were able to do this kind of numbers without, you know, being on TNT or TBS or the USA Network or or even the National Network, uh, Spike TV. But we're gonna get we're gonna get right down to it, man. First match of the night, and, and to me, like that's what's kind of. You know, the negative thing of this uh, pay-per-view right here, a lot of people are down on this show. And a lot of it just has to do with the way the main event was handled. So they actually do the main event first. So Taz actually takes on Chris Candido, coming out there with Tammy Lynn Sitch, who's actually Sonny. And uh, they do the main event first. I I'm not sure why. Um, I couldn't really find out an exact reason. I, I don't think it was anything catastrophic, but maybe Candido was hurt. They only go about a minute. I swear to God, Candido... I think he was about to do a leg drop and he missed it and then Taz chokes him out. So it wasn't a total squash. You know, Candido was about to get some offense in, but, you know, Taz actually makes him choke out in, in just a little bit over a minute. I got to say, Sonny looked like she was, you know, starting to decline here in terms of just the way she looked. She just looked pale, just didn't look anywhere near uh, the 1996 version of Sonny. And then uh, the Dudleys come out and they do the 3D on Taz and, you know, Bubba's cutting a heel promo. You got too much of the Dudleys on this show, uh, too much Bubba Ray. It, it does seem like, 
you know, whenever we do these classic reviews, whether it's TNA, ROH, uh, even WrestleMania, it's like, man, you cannot get away from Bubba Ray Dudley. You know, and even like going back to, you know, when he got the title shot against Josh Alexander, I think the general perception is, yeah, I don't really want to order a pay-per-view with Josh Alexander versus uh, Bully Ray as the main event. So you get Taz versus Bubba Ray Dudley uh, in the main event. You know, the match wasn't bad. I just... I just get the feeling like a lot of people just didn't care for it. And then at the same time, you know, I, I'm, I would imagine this is around the time when Taz, you know, started to feel like, you know, he was getting a little bit complacent and, and wanted to do a little bit more. And, and maybe he wanted to go to WWE. You know, he talked about that in the rise and fall of ECW. I was like, I'm main eventing pay-per-views. And now what? You know, maybe if you kept, you know, feeding Taz, you know, better challenges, um, you know, maybe he wouldn't have felt like that. And, you know, maybe RVD uh, was, you know, that should have been the main event on this show, but it was on the middle of the show. All right. Next up, we have the Dudleys uh, coming out there with Joel Gardner. And uh, sign guy Dudley uh, to take on Balls Mahoney and Spike Dudley. All right, so what, one of the one of the issues with um, you know watching this shit on the uh, WWE Network or Peacock is, yeah, you know you don't have the um, you know the theme music, and it's kind of funny. Like, how did ECW get away with using the theme music on pay per view without? You know them getting copyright claims i'm I'm not really sure I, I i'm really not sure you know it's the same thing with honor club so if you watch honor club it seems to me like they mute the music instead of you know just adding tracks the way wwe does wwe has so much like music that jim jim johnston produced that they own that they could just throw in you know tracks to cover it up uh but yeah i, I could definitely see that a lot of people just said have always said to me you know you got to buy the the original shows you know there's nothing like having the original shows anything that the wwe is going to show you is just not it's not <laughs> it's just not going to be uh you know give you that same feeling so that's one of the um the downsides of watching it on the network but still it's not like you can't see what's going on so i, j I just want to make that point but hey the dudley's taking on balls mahoney and, and spike dudley here you know this this was pretty crazy i, I mean it was it wasn't great balls mahoney Balls Mahoney is um man I could tell a lot of stories about Balls Mahoney but yeah he 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 is definitely um you know ECW to a T you know the fans the fans love them and um you know really kind of you know embodies I I I think what ECW is all about cuz you know you, let, let's be honest Balls Mahoney you know there's just no way you know this dude would have made it you know without ECW but he was able to kind of do his thing here um, I think it was Joel Gardner at Sign Guy and Deli. They were trying to throw fireballs at him, and then Balls Mahoney spit a fireball right back at him. Uh, but the Dudley boys go over uh, with the 3D. You know, the match really wasn't anything to talk about. It, re it really wasn't anything crazy. Uh, but hey, man, you get to see Balls Mahoney uh, on the show. He would actually main event against RVD later on in the year. And he really wasn't a bad worker. Like, he he was crazy. Like, he was he was willing to do crazy stuff. Yeah, you know. And the fans really kind of gravitated towards him. Uh, all right, next up we have Super Crazy taking on Tacha Michinoko. Um, it, it, it was pretty good. It's it's a little bit disappointing when you consider you know the talents involved here. Big one for Super Crazy though, for him to go over Taka. Um, you know, it's got to be a huge win. You know, because think about how you know high up on the radar Taka Michinoko was. You know earlier on you know going back to barely legal even coming off of the great 1998 stuff he did at wrestlemania and the wwe and uh, super crazy gets a nice victory over taka michinoko here and they both look good I, I just this just felt to me like it was a television match and that's one of the great things about aew right now like you would never get with, with the tony khan pay-per-view when you got two talents like this on an aew show it just feels to me like tony khan you know, would always give two guys that are, you know, capable, you know, the green light. This just kind of felt like they just didn't get enough time, you know, for whatever the reason. But it was still good, though. You know, Crazy did the around the world, you know, best moonsault ever from every single part of the turnbuckle. I, th I thought that was pretty cool. You know, Taka, you know, he was doing some good selling with the knee. But, you know, he 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 delivered some high end explosive spots, too. You know, he definitely got up in the air here. It wasn't like he... You know, I noticed any sort of decline from him. But, yeah, Crazy goes over with a nice little powerbomb, uh, you know, to end this thing. 
Yeah, so a big win for Super Crazy. I mean, he would do a lot of stuff, you know, later on in 1999 with Tajiri and with Little Guido. So next up, we have Tajiri actually taking on Little Guido. Uh, so Guido's actually Nunzio, and Tajiri is obviously Tajiri from the WWE. Most people do know him. I, you know, this was really before Tajiri got, you know, Heymanized, or me, or maybe if you want to call it, you know. You know, Vince McMahonized. I don't know how much Vince really had to do with tweaking Tajiri, but when, when Tajiri came to the WWE, it seemed like he was, you know, already pretty much packaged, you know, with the mist and the tarantula and, you know, the facial expression. So, yeah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe you want to credit Paul Heyman with really Tajiri finding it from a character standpoint. Uh, but yeah, this is Tajiri, like, this is like the Japanese version of Tajiri. You know, the non-Americanized, you know, version of Tajiri. And he's taking on uh, little Guido here. Um, we're talking about Nunzio as Guido. <laughs> it's funny. So if you ever see the uh, Sopranos, you know, Meadow and, and, you know, Tony Soprano's daughter, Meadow, she ends up dating um, Jackie Jr. And, and he will be like the Guido of the Sopranos, where it kind of fits those stereotypes of this guy that, you know, is supposed to go to school, he, does, he doesn't really go to class, you know, he, he dates Meadow, and then he, he cheats on her when he's sick, you know, he's just not a good guy, even though he's a pretty good looking guy, and, and, and Jackie Jr. and Meadow actually made for a really nice looking couple, but still, you know, it's like there's there's a lot of negative stereotypes that go with, uh, you know, the, uh, the term Guido, so, you know, I'm not saying Nunzio was as good looking as that guy, but he kind of, he kind of fits the description of it. You know, uh, Nunzio, hell of a wrestler, underrated wrestler. He's in really, really good shape, too. Um, him and Tajiri had a good match here. Uh, you know, Guido just did a lot of good, you know, submission work on the arm. Just a lot of arm bars that came out of nowhere. Uh, you know, Tajiri, this is before he started doing like a lot of, you know, crazy stuff with the move set here before the tarantula, before even some of like the super kicks. But he delivered a sweet looking, um, you know, brain buster, a, a beautiful baseball slide into the, the, the tree of woe spot where, you know, Guido was just hung up in the tree of woe upside down. I thought that was pretty cool. But yeah, it was pretty good. I, I would actually say that they topped the super crazy match. And, you know, eventually super crazy would, you know, blend in with these two guys and, you know, they had some, people love, you know, the three-way dances, you know, between Tajiri, Crazy, and Guido that would take place, you know, later on in 1999. All right, next up, we have Lance Storm coming out there with Tammy Lynn Bitch, uh, better known as uh, Dawn Marie. God, Dawn Marie looked awesome here. So Lance Storm comes out with, uh, you know, Dawn Marie and uh taking on tommy dreamer coming out there with francine i gotta say the women in ecw i think Heyman did a good job of you know marketing the women you know they they came off with a a very very good edge to them i would definitely say um i think they looked hot at the same time they were very revealing it, it just it felt it felt different it felt different than um you know even what you would see in, in wwe at that time I, I, I would definitely say so storm taking on dreamer all right one of the, one of the downsides about this show is that there's not like a lot of good like video packages here it's only two and a half hours i guess they just didn't have enough time to talk about the good story listen that, that's one of the great things about ecw is the promos you know leading up to some of these matches so you know i'm, I'm sure on hardcore tv there must have been some great dialogue between these two but hey, man, you know, Storm uh, and Dreamer right here, you know, the only thing I remember from Lance Storm at this time was, you know, he was really, you know, going at the ECW fans for insinuating that he was on steroids. I remember, you know, he cut some good heel promos there. So I, at the time, I think Dreamer is actually feuding with the Impact players. I think he had a really, really good match with Justin Credible at, uh, I think it was at Anarchy Rules. Um, but yeah, this was crazy here. This is an ECW style match. I, I, I thought, you know, this pretty much had everything you wanted from ECW. Um, you know, crazy table spots, you know, crazy, um, you know, just crazy bumps. Everything you could want, and then violence with the women. You know, the women definitely did get involved here. Cyrus Survivors gets involved. I got to give Storm credit, man. He was actually, his neck actually got stuck on the ladder, and then Dreamer just blasted with the chair. That was pretty crazy. But, you know, ultimately, you know, Storm takes advantage of all the uh, interference, and he does a spinning heel kick off the top rope while Tommy Dreamer has the trash can you know, around his head. So it was, a, it was a pretty crazy finish, pretty satisfying match. I wouldn't say it was great, but 
You know, I, I think Storm really did. He really did fit in well with ECW. And then, you know, he was going to WCW as well. He fit in really, really well, I think, with both companies. And, um, yeah, Dreamer get a great, great effort here. He, you know, Dreamer's an underrated worker. You know, I, I don't want to say that, you know, he's all about just, you know, taking the beating and just bleeding because he actually has some good fundamentals as well. I thought I thought him and Storm actually worked a pretty good match here. I think Dreamer's finisher was beautiful. He has, he did like a TKO Death Valley driver to Lance Storm off the top rope through the table. You know, that same finish that he hit to, uh, you know, C.W. Anderson at, at Guilty as Charged, the last pay-per-view, did the same exact thing here. So, yeah, this, this was a war. This is pretty damn good. I, I'll tell you, like from the super crazy match on, until the RVD match, you know, you, you had like four quality matches, you know, consecutively. And I think I think what kind of hurts the pay-per-view is, you know, just just the uh, the slow start that it got off to. Maybe the confusing start with with Candido and, um, you know, because they, they from what I understand, they promoted Candido as if, as if he was going to be in the main event. And um so no, we gotta we're gonna get right down to it. We got Rob Van Dam uh defending the ECW television championship uh against Jerry Lynn. Um no time limit. So if you remember at Guilty as Charged, they actually went to a twenty minute time limit draw. And you know, the referee was gonna award I you know, I am not clear about this either. I I mean I'd have to go back and watch it again. But apparently the referee was gonna award the belt to Jerry Lynn without even, you know, Jerry Lynn, you know, um I don't even think they had judges. And it's not like Jerry Lynn pinned or submitted him, but I, I guess just because of the the ref the referee could actually, you know, choose who performed better, and he was going to give it to Jerry, and then Jerry said, no, 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 I I I need five more minutes, and then they gave him five more minutes, and RVD won and won in overtime at uh at, at living living dangerously 1999. I think that was in March, right? That was in March of '99. So. In some ways, like if, if you watch that Living Dangerously match, I, I do feel like it's a little bit more crisp. There's actually some some botches here that, that people use against the Hardcore Heaven match. But, you know, that's like 20 minutes of just perfection there. I, I just thought they were they had amazing chemistry. Um, you know, it was only 20 minutes and the, the five minute overtime was beautiful i mean that 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 was an awesome match as well i don't know why it it, just, it took a while for the living dangerously match um to become accessible it really didn't become accessible until maybe like 2005 it never got a dvd release it wasn't like they showed it on the tv show like the, the hardcore heaven match was just so accessible you could put it you could you know you could turn on the tv and watch it you could go to the blockbuster video store and and watch it it'll be the first thing you see so that's why it probably gets more love but in some ways i think the living dangerously match it um i, I think it was really the first time where you just knew that they had something special uh, at least on pay-per-view so i mean obviously they had that match at the ecw arena in 98 i just don't know you know how that match compares at the time to what they were doing on pay-per-view because this just feels like they were just you know blowing it out of the water here i mean these are you know they're definitely five-star matches I, I i think they deserve that rating you know even the legendary jay briscoe i think he even said you know before he faced jerry lynn for the roh title that you know that like those are the matches that made him want to get into the business so anytime you got like some of the greatest performers of all time actually coming out and saying like i wanted to get in the business because of flair and steamboat or rvd and jerry lynn like to me that kind of validates it as a classic or a five-star match even if you don't think maybe this hasn't aged as well when you watch it and compare this to omega versus osprey or you know brian danison versus um you know whoever Nigel mcginnis but uh but yeah rob van damme jerry lynn this is the rematch uh from hardcore heaven all right so so <laughs> god damn the, the first time uh i watched this match uh, it was actually on tape from the video store. I, I said to myself, you know, and, and this is when I was starting to get back into it. I was watching, um, dur you know, this is during the invasion. So, you know, you're watching Raw and SmackDown every single week. And, you know, the pay-per-views are still, you know, th th this is still during the era where you can't fuck around during the pay-per-view. Like, you, you got to get in and out. So when I watched this for the first time, I was just amazed at how much time they were taking. I was like, man, what, when are they going to wrestle? Like, there's this Rob Van Dam doing a lot of taunting. He's doing the thumbs, you know, signature. Uh, he's just kind of mocking Jerry Lynn. And it, it just, it just kind of felt like RVD was doing too much 
playing up to the crowd. It felt like it went on for like 10 minutes. But when I watch this back now, I I'm so accustomed to seeing so much, you know, stuff over the years from Ring of Honor and, you know, you name it over and over again that it just it, it just feels like a regular match to me it, do, it doesn't feel like uh, rvd's like stalling for time uh you know rvd was actually saying that like he wrestled jerry lynn for you know 30 to 40 45 minutes sometimes i don't think they ever went to 40 minutes but you know th to me i think this is like their longest match ever and it, it only goes about 27 minutes so uh but you get the point rvd was just very comfortable um in ECW, he would get time. He was allowed to use weapons. Uh, he was more comfortable with the ring, too. He was saying, and he, he did like an alternate commentary with Michael Cole uh, on the rise and fall of ECW. He was saying that it took him a long ass time to get used to the WWE rings because I believe they were actually, these ECW rings, they were actually, you know, made out of cables. I think the WWE rings, you know, the ropes were actually made out of. Was it nylon? I, I, I can't remember what he was saying there. But you, you get the point. Like, he, he had a tough time adjusting to the WWE ring. So I, I just thought that was interesting. You know, no one really talks about, like, the differences between, you know, an ECW ring or an ROH ring. But, uh, yeah, I guess, you know, it, it, was, it was cool to get a glimpse of, uh, you know, just how tough, you know, the transition was. But um, in, in terms of uh, RVD and Jerry Lynn, it's just a beautiful matchup. RVD is just very complimentary to Jerry, um, you know, with these matches. You know, it, it, it seems like he, he always goes out of his way to say, you know, no one was able to keep up with me like Jerry Lynn did. You know, to the point where he, they, he wanted to resurrect this in, in uh, TNA for for uh, hardcore justice and eventually I think it ended up being bound for glory and I, I just don't think they were ever able to you know recapture the magic that they had here in the spring of of 1999 it was just I just think like when you watch these back I'm just amazed at the athleticism the counters uh the innovativeness uh, the the innovation it's the proper word for it. I, I, I just love it. Even like some of the little things here where, you know, you know, RVD is trying to, you know, go for a, a spinning kick while Jerry Lynn kind of bridges up and Jerry gets out of the way. RVD does a, a spinning leg drop. Jerry gets out of the way. Just the little counters that they were doing. I was just like, man, I'm just it just blows you away at, at how good it was here. Jerry just had, you know, some tremendous moments here. Um in terms of uh, athleticism, the sunset flips that he would do here, the bulldogs that he would do, they just, they look beautiful. Uh, in terms of uh, reaction here, RVD is typically a heel at this time. But, you know, Jerry had some support here, too. Like, the, the, the reaction for RVD, I wouldn't say it was anywhere near as overwhelming as it was during the invasion. And, and it did seem like Jerry had a lot of support. There was, like, a lot of, you know, new effing show chants, uh, you know, for Jerry Lynn, no doubt about it. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I think, I think what makes these matches great is just the, the world-class athleticism. And then when you blend it in with just, you know, some of these, you know, insane spots, you know, whether it's Jerry doing the uh, sunset flip through the table or, you know, Van Damme doing the Van Der Van Daminator with the assist from Bill Alfonso. Bill Alfonso was huge in this match too, just with some of the assist and with, with Jerry Lynn trying to counter, you know, some of the other, you know, Bill Alfonso, uh, you know, chair throws. I mean, it was, it was, it was some crazy stuff here, man. I, I, I think the match, it, it aged pretty well. So th there's one like really, really bad botch here, and the fans start chanting, "You fucked up!" And you know, Michael Cole actually asked Rob Van D Rob Van Dam. He, he asked him like, well, "What's going through your mind when uh, when that happens?" And he's just like, "You know, he basically he's kicking himself in the ass." And I can't believe that happened. But you know, it's funny because RVD is such a cocky, cocky guy. Like you know. He doesn't like to admit that he fucks up, but you know he he just he just said he he, he takes it really hard, uh, you know when when he does hear that from the fans. But um, yeah, you know what was interesting here when when Jerry did the sunset flip to RVD through the table, um, you know Van Dam he was already busted up on his eye, I think from a forearm from Jerry Lynn, but then he was saying that he still has a scar, you know from that piece of the table. So yeah, RVD's has some really dangerous table bumps. Uh, I think against the Eliminators too, where the table breaks and then the sharp jagged edges from the table, like it, it almost penetrated his eye one time, which could have been a nightmare. It could have lost his eye. So uh, so that that was crazy. But yeah, I think 
I think, um, you know, Jerry really did a beautiful job here in terms of just convincing, you know, the fans that, you know, he was going to win this match. It just, it just felt like at this time, the TV title felt very, very credible, especially compared to, you know, Taz's uh, ECW title reign. I mean, this has been going on for a long time. So, yeah, I mean, they gave you some really, really satisfying near falls. And like I was saying, man, that there's a spot from Living Dangerously where, you know, Bill Alfonso throws the chair into the ring. RVD catches it. Somehow, some way, Jerry actually dodges the move and he does a leg drop to, to RVD on the chair. It's a beautiful sound effect. I mean, you, you need the sound loud as hell just to appreciate how awesome that sequence was. So they play off of it here with uh, Alfonso actually throws the chair uh, to Van Damme. I think Jerry intercepts it. He throws the the chair back at Bill Alfonso and then he, he does a German and then a bridge to RVD for the near fall. It's, it's an incredible spot as well. There's also a, fr a frog splash that Van Damme hits. Jerry Noel sells it, and then he hits a small package right away for another near fall. There's some beautiful transitions out of the, um, you know, the cradle pile driver from RVD, and then Jerry follows it up with another schoolboy. So, yeah, I mean, I think at the time, there just was some really, you know, innovative back and forth with the near falls that you probably never really experienced Um you know, in the United States at that time. I mean, it had to be a breath of fresh air, you know, at that time. Um, you know, the only negative about it is, you know, th th there's that one botch, which is crazy. And I think Jerry actually... So Jerry here, I think he actually gets a concussion. There's one sequence here where he's just laid out on, on the top rope. RVD does a, a springboard, you know, one-legged kick. And then Jerry actually just falls to the to the mat and i think he hits his head the living dangerously spot is actually better than that it, 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 there's there's an incredible table bump when rvd does the exact same move at living dangerously but for whatever reason i think jerry actually got more fucked up uh on that spot but yeah man uh the ending actually comes with uh once again bill alfonso you know throws the chair into the ring jerry catches it rvd does the van daminator and then follows it up with another even higher uh, five-star frog splash uh, to get the victory here. There's a code of honor too, which is cool because RVD is a heel, but I like the code of honor. I think at the time it felt different. RVD was saying that he was the, um, he felt like he was the best wrestler in the world at that time. I, I, I think his biggest competition would either be Chris Benoit or, or Austin. I know Austin really wasn't allowed, you know, to wrestle a lot in 99 in terms of, you know, you know, the actual, you know, matches because of the health problems and just, you know, the Russo style of booking. But but I do feel like Austin was still like arguably the best worker in the United States. You know, obviously you have the debate about all Japan at the time. I'm sure Kabashi Misawa or, you know, whatever was going on in, you know, Japanese wrestling at that time, you, you still want to incorporate them. But I, I would definitely say like if you if you're going to narrow it down, like I think RVD or Benoit, like it was between them for best wrestler in the United States, uh, you know, at that particular time. All right, so is there anything else I could say about this match, man? I think it's a classic. I, I would actually say, though, I think the Living Dangerously match, I, I think their chemistry was a little bit more flawless in that match, but this was still, but for whatever the reason, I just think this was a little bit more accessible. Uh, they got more time. You got a, you know, decisive winner here, no time limit. Um, could go on and on about how good this was man and it, and it's it, it's a shame too like you know rvd's had a ton of great opponents i mean think about how many great opponents you know rob was able to work with including guys like benoit and angle and, and he's and, and even jericho too like jericho you would think jericho would be able to kind of replicate what jerry lynn did but for whatever the reason you know rvd never clicked with anyone uh as good as jerry lynn you know maybe the closest would be jeff hardy oh that's the other thing i wanted to say you know that that van daminator at the end onto jerry lynn for some reason like i just thought rvd you know when he got to the wwe he, he started nailing that even better um the one against jeff hardy at invasion i don't i don't think he's ever hit a better van daminator than that so you know credit jeff hardy it's a tough move to take too but yeah that that is a sweet move uh so bill alfonso he's a little bit annoying but you know uh, he has a unique persona and uh yeah i love the way he kind of uses you know you know helps rvd out 
with all the assists. It's a it's a pretty cool uh, combination, man. Yeah, Bill Alfonso and RVD. It's just you know the the, the combination with RVD, Sabu, and Alfonso, uh, very multi dimensional, just very different. You know, we've never really seen anything like it in terms of you know the the, the differences between the wrestlers and the actual manager. Al Alfonso was a unique ass personality. I'll I'll just leave it at that. Okay, next up, I think Just Incredible was supposed to take on um, Shane Douglas. Uh, Shane Douglas could not make the show. <laughs> so he comes out there with uh, Jason and Jazz. Everyone remembers Jazz from the WWE. And, um, you know, Sid actually comes out. Sid Vicious. Uh, Sid comes out to a hero's welcome. I'll tell you, so in, in ECW, Sid was really, really over. <laughs> it's funny, man, because S Sid is really, really weird, man. He, he's weird. It's it's almost like, how how do you, you know, categorize Sid in terms of how over he is with smart marks? I just don't know, man. It's, it's, it's crazy because, you know, people would, most people would agree. He's not a great wrestler. You know, you would, you would, you would almost agree. Like he's had some of the worst WrestleMania main events of all time. Maybe, maybe the two worst when you think about it, but for some reason, he's still really, really over with smart marks. You know, even that survivor series 96 main event, like look at how over he was with the male demographic at that show. It's, it's crazy because he had a great look, man. He looked like a badass, and he deserves a lot of credit, you know, for really, you know, you know, getting the Attitude Era underway. Because, you know, it wasn't the Attitude Era at Survivor Series 96. And you got to remember, for as over as Austin was on that show, uh, you know, Sid was the most over guy, you know, winning the title from Sean that night. So you got to give Sid a lot of credit. You know, he got a hero's welcome here. The ECW fans love Sid. I don't think it had anything to do with the wrestling. I just I just think they love the, uh, you know, just his demeanor. You know, he really wasn't able to do much here. He just comes in the ring and gives uh, Just Incredible a choke slam. He does, uh, you know, the psycho power bomb to everybody else in the ring. Lance Storm comes out and he helps out Just Incredible. And then Sabu comes to the rescue. Sabu actually, it's funny, he's supposed to be helping out Sid, but he ends up, he ends up actually doing the... Uh, the Arabian leg drop through the table to Sid, and then he takes out the other guy. I think his name is Jason. I, I don't know if there was another guy out there that was playing a judge, but uh, you know, after Sid does the power bomb, Joey Styles said, "Man, I wish someone did that to Judge Ito after the OJ case." So that was pretty funny. Yeah, Just Incredible actually said that he's guiltier than OJ, but there's no jury that's gonna uh, charge him and make him go to jail. So, you know, uh, you know, it was it was a pretty cool, you know, uh, experience for Just Incredible here. You know, Sid comes out, Sabu, you did get to see Sabu, but it's really not much of a match, but it's a fun segment. And then the main event, we have Taz uh, taking on Bubba Ray Dudley. So yeah, you know, Bubba actually cuts a promo here. It's almost like the retarded version of Bubba you know, sprinkling it in with him acting like a little bit more of an asshole, a little bit more of a bully. I, I just really didn't care for it. I thought the promo dragged uh, big time. It, it's funny, man. This is 99. Think about it. Three years later, Taz would be on SmackDown. Um, you know, Bubba would actually be, you know, challenging Triple H on Raw for the world title. When, uh, you know, I think he was the first guy to get a title shot after Bischoff gave Triple H the belt. So think about how much happens between the spring of 99 and you know the summer of 2002 it's it, it's crazy but you know at, at this time taz is still you know the uh you know the man in ecw they're chanting actually taz taz is going to kill you i i don't think the match was that great I, I think you know what really hurt this match they spent like maybe five minutes you know brawling in the crowd i mean they really there's a shot of a ton of ecw fans close up even going out of the arena into the concession stands or you know the outer part of the arena it really does kind of drag um when they get back into the ring taz is a bloody mess though this is the most i've ever seen taz bleed he had a face full of blood you know bubba's busted up as well uh this is actually ftw rules even though i, I don't think taz is the ftw champion at this point and uh, i mean it, it was okay i mean taz you know it was impressive to see him suplex bubba you know, Bubba, you know, even though Taz is a is a pretty, you know, fatter dude, he's carrying a lot of like body fat, you know, Bubba is carrying, you know, 10 times more. So, you know, the the, the suplexes off the top rope looked impressive. The, uh, you know, the T-bone through the table, uh, you know, Bubba had a tough time rotating on that. You know, Bubba kicked out of 
uh, kicked out of that. But he did get some help from Devon. He got help from Sangha Dudley. You know, they, they actually attacked the referee out of frustration. And there's a replacement referee. But ultimately, Taz makes, uh, you know, Bubba, you know, submit. Yeah, it's, it's, it's probably one of the weaker things of the show. But, hey, you know, it, it is... You know, it's a it's a ECW main event featuring two guys that became household names uh, in the WWE. Um, you know, Taz is a very loyal dude. You know, if, if if you remember, like when they were doing their SmackDown and Raw stuff, you know, over the years, he was always very very loyal to SmackDown. You know, anybody that was SmackDown related, you know, Taz Taz he's he's pretty loyal. I I, I remember even when the Dudleys. You know, I, I think they didn't want to renew the Dudley's contract or they gave him a low ball offer. I, I think Taz stepped up and just said, you know, he thinks it's a mistake. He thinks that the WWE is ma- missing out on, you know, signing, uh, you know, Bubba and, and Devon. But, and then ultimately they ended up going to TNA. Um, so, yeah, Taz has always been a, a big supporter uh, of the Dudleys. It, it does kind of seem like, you know, when Taz was in ECW, he was like a shark and was against everybody. You know, even RVD, I, I think him and Taz had their ups and downs. But if you notice, when Taz was on commentary in the WWE, he was always very complimentary to anybody, overly complimentary to anybody he worked with in ECW. And, you know, anytime they did a Raw versus SmackDown thing, it always felt to me like Taz, uh, you know, was super connected with anybody that was a SmackDown guy, and he looked at Raw guys as being the enemy. I don't know if it's a Italian thing or if that goes back to the, um, you know, the old days with family history and everything. You know, back in because I know Taz is Italian. I think his name is Peter Cernersha, but you know, I don't know how you want to look at it. But um, but yeah, man. I mean, with with Hardcore Heaven 1999, the general perception is, I think that you know from ECW fans that, that were watching the company at the time, I think they kind of feel like, um, you know, 99 was, was a, a decline for the company. And I, I think you could feel it here, especially with the main event. I, I think the perception was, you know, the magic just wasn't quite there with a lot of these matches. And, you know, most people would agree that 94, 95, 96 was the glory days in terms of, uh, you know, storylines and in terms of, uh, you know, booking. Uh, but by 99, it, it seems like by 99, like the perception was that ECW, WWE and WCW were, were all like just, you know, starting to decline a little bit in terms of the quality of the, uh, you know, the promotions. Uh, so that's funny to think about. But, you know, I, I guess ECW's heyday, you know, most people would agree it's 94, 95, 96. They didn't get on pay-per-view until 97. So I guess you could definitely argue that one, once they did get on pay-per-view, the product probably wasn't as good in terms of angles and storylines and just being fully invested. I think that's that's kind of the perception that I get. You know, a lot of people just think that the 99 was an awful year, you know, for mainstream wrestling, even though, you know, they were obviously making a, a shitload of money because of the television deals. And, you know, I, I, you know, this is the year where all three promotions, you know, had, you know, television deals. But uh, I'll just leave it right there, man. RVD and Jerry Lynn, it's still... I would still put it as a top ten match of all time. If if you didn't grow up with this match, I could I could see how you know you could say ah oh, it's just it's kind of been topped and it just doesn't hold up as well as you know what we've seen from you know the elite and Kenny Omega and you know a lot of the other you know crazy shit that we've seen over the years. I, I could totally understand that, but still, I think when you go back in '99, I don't think you know two guys have ever really found it the way they found it in terms of incorporating athleticism you know, with hardcore spots and, you know, for whatever reason, I think they seem to do it better than anybody. So I'll just end it right there, man. That's hardcore heaven, 1999 and I'm out.